And I've just started recording. Yes, we can see it. Thanks. Spectacular. All right. So, Dan's uh, hooked us up this afternoon with uh, a potential new standard design that's uh, going to be joining our contemporary range of, of I guess, uh, and may make it onto the brochure, maybe. Um, I think it'd be a, an excellent one to start with. It, it's relatively uh, straightforward, but has a few little things that need to be looked at also. So um, I guess if we step right back to the start, client walks in, to the, in the door and says, I like this design that's sitting in your design brochure or sitting on your desk, whatever the case is, the first thing we need to do is obviously create a job for it. So we would do that from loading up your jobs database and coming up to new job. Uh, if they're an existing client whose details you already have or, or not, you would set them up as a new client. So we're just going to set this one up as test training at this stage. And obviously you choose the relevant option. Training. So to click that, you select the icon in the top right hand corner of any job, is that correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. It's available uh, from the, uh, yeah, when you've loaded your database and you're on the job screen, uh, it'll appear in the top right-hand corner above save, uh, on what, no matter what job you're on. Training potential new standard. All right. So as you can see, we've now just created a new job. It's brought in the contractual name by adding the, the, the first and last name, just entered into the client contacts field together. The first thing we need to do is obviously try and capture uh, a site address from them if possible. If they don't have a site in mind at this stage or they've they're still got a few, a few on the cards, you could leave that sit for the moment. Uh, the next step would be to choose the design. The design's very, very important because when you're ref uh, issuing an estimate to somebody, you want to tie that specifically to something visual and tangible to rely on. Uh, so if you don't have the design listed on a, on a preliminary estimate and you're not very, very clear in your naming convention of that document, uh, a client could literally turn up with a completely separate, completely different design and say, this is the price you gave me to build this house. So that's where this design drop down is very, very important. Uh, as you can see, there's many, many standard designs in there. This will be growing in time uh, as we start to populate some of our newer designs in there and, and also many of our older ones which seem to be getting a lot more traction as of late. Um, in this instance it, it doesn't exist uh, as of yet, as you, it doesn't have a name, it doesn't have a design type yet, it's, so we'll just put that in as a custom design. So if you press the letter C it'll allow you to jump down or any other letter, so custom design and then we'll just hit save. So the other option is if this was a house and land package, you could tick that box and you could put in the land value and the like. So I always uh, start estimating my jobs by copying a standard where possible. There's so many standard notes and so many uh, litigious things that need to be thought of when preparing an estimate that it's, it's always worthwhile referring to a job you've previously done um, just recently or, or also uh, one of our standards that are, that are available from your database. So to do that we come over to IPROX and as you can see there's absolutely nothing there. So we're going to hit new forward slash select in the top left hand corner. Tick this little box that says copy from another job. And this search box allows you to search for a client's name or job number. In, in, in this instance, we're going to search for standard space hyphen, and as you can see, it starts searching as you're typing. So the one I always like to pick up when I'm doing single story houses is the Avalon. It's right at the top of the list, and, and I know it's going to have the most up-to-date uh, notes in it. Obviously, it takes a while for me to update every single standard because there's so many of them. So if I'm going to start, I'm going to start from the top. So I always know the Avalon is going to be the most up-to-date standard that I can rely on in terms of notes and standard conditions. So what you do is... So you whenever... Oh, you're up. Sorry. So whenever Shane updates the Avalon in the system, it's updated for everybody across the entire network. 
Um, it won't apply to any job you've copied based upon that, but it, it, the next time you load that job and load that, that IPROX model, it will have those, those new notes and, and various adjustments made to it. So we're just going to, now we're going to make that, select it and make sure the most recent one, which is always housed at the top, is in orange, and then we're going to hit copy. So we just jump back here to IPROX details. You can see it's made an exact copy of the Avalon 191 preliminary estimate. Absolutely everything's identical except it will show your name as the creator and the date it was created. Now the very, very, very first thing that we need to do, which is literally the most important, is adjust this expiry date. It act, when you copy an estimate, it copies it in its entirety along with its expiry date. So we need to adjust that to 30 days from today by hitting these three little dots. There's nothing worse than issuing an estimate in, uh, in say, June with an expiry date that's well into the future that could come back to hurt you. Now, these items here in this top header, they are what's printed on your estimate. So I'm just going to hit this little save dialog and display that for you guys just so you understand. So that's essentially what drives this title block or the, the information field at the top is these free form text fields. Now our standard base price in IPROX uh, which is this field here, the base price which is driven by these quantities allows for an N2 win classification and an M class soil classification with no peering allowance and earthworks to a maximum one metre of fall. If the site has any more than one metre of fall, then you have to allow additional earthworks in the calc bar, or sorry, in the site works, site costs, once over in job workup, or if the wind classification is anticipated to be anything higher than these, then sometimes it's worthwhile making that, that allowance up front so there isn't such a rude shock for the client. Now, all of our standards are based upon assumed perfect site conditions so that they're applicable and useful for everybody and uh, I guess allows us to, to achieve the cheapest price we can on paper. So because I have no knowledge of where this house is going to be built, um, what kind of soil conditions uh, it's going to have or anything of the like, we're going to leave these items as they are, assumed M, assumed N2, TBA obviously you know, to be advised, um, assumed nil bushfire, there's no allowance of bushfire on our base price and, and if you write nil and then it turns out that there is, um, you're probably in for a world of hurt so I, I tend to always just leave it as assumed because we are not a local authority, we do not have any divine knowledge and even if the, the client says to you, oh no there's no bushfire, I know there's no bushfire, always leave it as assumed because the only person who has that knowledge and the only person who will decide whether or not it's applicable is the local authority, which is someone you haven't spoken to as of yet. Um, the same applies with obviously these other items here. Um, we assume that we'll be able to connect to a town sewer within 10 lineal metres. Uh, we assume it's going to be bottled gas and there's no allowance for trenching or service lines for reticulated. Uh, and we're assuming the corrosion zone is, is of a moderate uh, value and in the past we have spoken about this corrosion zone <coughs> sorry, and the implications that can have uh, when, when you get up into severe marine locations and uh, steel work getting affected by brick work and, and the like. Um, so we'll, we'll leave that as is for, for the time being and we'll touch it on that again in the future. So the first thing we want to do is, is obviously adjust the estimate header which is this orange text at the top. So that needs to be reflective. I always name it to match the design that's been issued or I, I actually name it to match <coughs> the, the, the applicable round. If, if it's a round one or a round two or a round three, we would, we would refer to it as, as that. So it's very clear and it's tied to a specific design type. Um, in this instance, we really don't have anything usable we can put on this document. So we would just refer to it as preliminary estimate along with the, the notation on the job details of a custom design. So 
when we print this item, it'll come up, as you'll see here, preliminary estimate, custom design. So, first thing you'll do is double check your pricing model is the most up to date, being July 2016, which was the, the recent 1% price increase we had. Um, the next thing we need to do is to start filling out these fields. Now, as I've said in the past, if, if you use our design service and use the service hub, these fields and these values are automatically derived and calculated from our drafting software and our drafting team and are made available on the floor plan so that you can very, very easily just drop them in with little to no thought. Um, if you're tendering based upon other people's designs, which is what I, what I tend to do these days, honestly, um, is, is you'll especially find that in metropolitan markets where clients seek to you know, find architects, do their own designs, and then turn up on your doorstep looking for a price. Then you'll have to manually quantify those uh, either by hand or using a, a PDF software like PDF Exchange Editor, which I have emailed out to, to, to the group once previously. Um, so if you want details on this product, um, it's, it's a free product, but it has very, very intuitive measuring tools, uh, allowing you to pick up areas and set custom scales. Um, I strongly advise you, you use it. Like I said, it's free. I, I'm not going to email everyone in the mail group a link to it again because it's probably just going to come off as spam to those who have already received it in the past. But if you do want details on it, um, yeah, do definitely send me an email and I'll, I'll send it over. So lower floor area, that's pretty straightforward. This is a slab on ground house. There's no upper floor area whatsoever. Any living area will be lower. And so we've got lower floor area being the living, that exact value there, 132.36. 132.36. Uh, there's also no garage in this house. The reason the garage is explicitly separated into a separate pricing template field is because generally a garage area is an open area. It will have far fewer walls than a living space uh, and is would thus have a, a, a lower square metre rate for construction. So we'll set that to zero. As you can see, as I adjust these fields, these calculations on the side here also adjust, and thus the pricing breakdown break, break <laughs> will uh, we'll move also. So we have a kitchen of 5.1. As we saw just here, kitchen 5.1 linear meters. Now we don't differentiate our pricing for fridge spaces, uh, overheads, or um, breakfast bars. We charge the same lineal meter rate for any kitchen cabinetry, straight out. Uh, it's so if so, the, it's yeah, it's in the client's best interest to always put uh, overheads in because otherwise, unless you add a line item credit in the workup, um, they're going to be paying the same amount whether or not they've got them or not. So, kitchen of 5.1, wet area of 17.5. Now, this entire house is clad, therefore the entire external perimeter uh, is clad. So we've got 62.06, 62.06 and total perimeter of 62.06. .06. So that field's especially important. Um, the external perimeter <coughs> And these floor area fields are measured to the external face of uh, either the brickwork or the cladding. So I'm just going to grab a drink. So if your house is clad, you obviously don't have a cavity, nor do you have a, a, a brick on the outside or a 250 millimeter system. You've generally got a 90 or 100 mil system by the time you add a um, add 
cladding to the outside. So our areas are measured to the external of that wall or to the external of the brickwork. So if you have a cladded house, the usable area is, is much more. Um, so that makes sense to me. Just it, it, is anyone unclear about that, or any, does anyone have microphones? Or well, you want to type in chat if you want me to explain that a different way. But effectively, the the area here being one hundred and thirty two point three six meters squared on a cladded house, about a hundred and thirty one of those is usable space because all you're losing is the ninety mil wall frame. But on a brick veneer house, if it was 132 square metres, the walls would actually be in here and where those walls are sitting would be full cavity. So the usable space in a cladded house is much more and therefore we need to charge for that extra usable space. So. Can you just quickly revisit with the kitchen size and the wet area size how there is that standard allowance and then you move up and down yes yep so Please. yep so lower floor area and upper floor area added together over here on the right hand side uh, to provide you well, sorry all these values added up to provide your total floor floor area now iGyro has a sliding scale or calculations uh, in the background that you don't see and, and they've been driven to say for every metre squared of home, you're entitled to X amount extra kitchen length and, extra, and an extra X amount per metre squared of wet area. So as the, the overall house area increases, your allowance for kitchen length and your allowance for uh, wet areas, laundries, uh, pretty much room, any room that requires waterproofing and tiling, the, the allowance or the for that those applicable items increases. So if you had a seven or eight lineal meter kitchen in a 150 square meter house overall, that's that that kitchen's going to cost you a considerable amount of money of, of what you're charging out. So so it's a sliding scale, and that scale is displayed by the excess kitchen and excess room wet room. So according to uh, iGyro's calculations in the back end. 5.1 lineal metres of kitchen is within the allowance. It's actually 0.02 lineal metres less than is allowed in that price. On the other hand, 17.5 square metres of wet area in a house that small is very much on the higher end. I mean, a, a, a 200 square metre house normally only has 20 or so square metres of wet area. So what it's doing is it's saying that of that 17.5, 5.19 metres squared of it is above the allowance and it's timesing that by $140 per square metre and adding $726.07 into the base price. So it's saying this wet area, this house that's been designed, uh, has obviously, you know, four bedrooms and an ensuite, so two bathrooms, and for that overall living space, is, is above standard and would cost more than say if that was just open area. I mean that's a no-brainer. So, it also means that using this example that you could give them another 0.02 lineal metres of kitchen and the price wouldn't change. That's correct, so, yes. If we step back to that, um, if you come in under the allowance there is absolutely no credit provided in the base price. So if you're designing to suit um, to, to suit a, the size of a home, it's always in your client's best interest to work to those allowances to the best as possible because they might be able to get a kitchen that has an extra me lineal metre of, of kitchen in it which to them has a massive perceived value. Um, but effectively your price wouldn't change at all if it, was, if it still stayed below that allowance. In this instance, uh, as Richard said, they would get an extra um, hair. <laughs> it would be about it, honestly. <laughs> but sometimes it can be a bit. It can be a couple of lineal meters, for example. And oh, it can be yeah. Thing that you can clinch the sale. So listen, I'll give you an extra two lineal meters of kitchen for no extra cost. Mm. We can throw that into this home if this is the home you'd like to build. Mm. 
um, yeah, assuming it's 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 within the allowances, which you'll find, as we're just saying, on on many big homes, 300, 350 square meter homes, the allowance uh, per linear meter and square meter for the no. areas. Saying, yeah. And the kitchens are quite high, so um, yeah, it's in your best. Well, it's in the client's best interest to to utilise that where possible. Um, so the lower floor or the covered deck area is any areas which are under roof but are unenclosed, i.e., they do not have four walls to them. Uh, so so deck two and deck one would be considered as being. Uh, unenclosed areas under roof. The pergola wouldn't because we would charge the pergola out as a separate line item in, in the job workup should the client want it. Obviously the roof line is following this space so that's all we're interested in is unenclosed areas underneath the roof line. So we would take 14.08 and add the 9 for deck 2 which is 23.08. Where does that calculator come from? It's like Houdini, it just appears out of nowhere. <laughs> That's a shortcut. I don't use it often. I only use it when I um, don't have my hand calculator, on, hand calculator on me. But if you want to use it, you hold down the Windows key on your keyboard, press the letter R, and then type in the word calc and enter. Like I said, I only use it when I forget to bring my calculator over to the desk with me. <laughs> Um, so we'll just rename this also. So, so 23. Sorry, someone speak. No. All right. So we've got the total perimeter length of 62.06. We've also concluded by looking at the floor plan and, and not seeing any brickwork hatching. Um, and also by looking at the elevations, it's entirely clad. The construction type is low set. Now this field here, this drop down box, uh, applies different uh, percentage loadings. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, okay. I'm just going to mute Rachel. All right, so as I was saying, um, this drop-down box, uh, low set, high set, steep side applies varying percentages of loadings. Uh, that's effectively what it is. After many, many years of building each of these homes, we were able to almost work it out down to a perfect T in terms of percentage loading. So the high set item, I have a piece of paper behind me, is 15% and the steep site is 30%. So if we press this, that price in theory should move up 15%, and if we change it to steep site, it will have moved up 30%. So that, that uh, percentage factor is effectively allowing for, if it was a high set, it allows for the scaffold, it allows for the stairs, it allows for all the stuffing around associated with a high set, and, uh, and much the same with steep site. In this instance, it's it's not relevant. We're, we're building a low set, so we just leave it where it is. Um, and then probably the most pivotal part of, of, of the training is setting your consent authority to the relevant location. Obviously, um, as we've spoken about before, the consent authority is a loading, uh, either negative or positive, applied to the base price. So Coffs Harbour for example, is set to 0.99 or 0.99. So, so it does all this mathematical equation, and then it divides it by 100 and times it by nine and times it by 99. So it says Coffs Harbour is marginally cheaper than what we define to be the base price. Um, so, varying consent authorities depending on uh, obviously trade costs, uh, remote location, um, have varying degrees of area loading. You establish those yourself for your consent authorities in your business contacts. So I always leave the standard set to Coffs Harbour because that's uh, effectively you know, where, where I reside and what we predominantly price the job workup items on. 
So if this was your area, you would choose the drop down box and you would choose your consent location and it would apply either a positive or a negative um, to the base price. And what about if you want to add, add in a new consent authority? Um, is that probably, that's, that's probably for another day <laughs> rather than right now. Um, so the fast track discount, uh, you're eligible to obviously use that if you so choose. Uh, we use it a lot in our business. Uh, we've, we've found that uh, not letting clients choose their own colours and dictating to them what they get and limiting their number of uh, plan changes to be, uh, I think it's two per round or, and they must be non-structural has really, really helped us bring down our overheads as a business and, and definitely saved many, many mistakes on site where clients have a perception of one thing and what is built is another. Um, many clients treat a colour selection document as being a, an agreement but don't realise that until a variation is actually raised, it's, it's, it's a wish list. So going to uh, Fast Track was, it, if I could get every house to be Fast Track, I'd be a very happy man. Um, so we'll leave this on for all intents and purposes at this time because it allows us to display a cheaper price. Obviously with strings attached. <clears throat> Alright, so the next thing we do, so that's effectively built the base price. This front screen is the base price here. So it's saying this house with absolutely nothing associated with it whatsoever has a base price of 194500 So then we move over to the job workup. Now, as you can see, it's also brought over every single line item that was uh, existing in that standard house that we copied. And, and that, that goes back to what I was saying about all the, the notes uh, and how important they are, uh, such as you know the, the termites and um, the service lengths, i.e. the 10 lineal meters allowed. Uh, the fact that there's no peering included, reinforcing the soil conditions, all that kind of stuff. So these are all just standard notes that I use on every and all standards and, and, and every pre preliminary estimate unless, unless we've obviously made allowance for those because we've known otherwise. So straight off the bat, this here's a standard line item for us where we are which is provide one builder's range double PowerPoint and conduit for future NBN. So we've got a lot of NBN activity happening in the areas that we're building. So what we do... Just quickly, is, yes. it can be really helpful to select the sales estimate PDF and print out a hard copy of this when you're first getting used to how the estimate will look and have that as a checklist that you work next to the screen as you go through it. I've found some people find that a useful approach. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, 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 that's pretty much how I do all my weekend pricing for the sales consultants. I print out what they've sent me, and uh, I, yeah, highlight it as I go to make sure that what the, yeah, what they want is is, is what I'm including essentially. Um, so, I seem, to, uh, I, I prefer, and this is a only a recent addition, probably the last six months, was the ability to have this drop down box here to display incomplete, complete, or complete ending complete items. I live most of my life on incomplete only. So when you copy a job over, it marks everything automatically as incomplete. So now effectively, if, if I could mark off half a, half a dozen of these as complete and if I got disrupted because I had to call a client or I had to leave the office or I was finished for the day, I could return in the morning and tick that box again and know exactly which, where I'm up to because the only items that haven't been done are those which are on screen effectively. So left click selects the items, right click on the items on your mouse brings up the action menu. We've got delete, mark incomplete, mark complete, edit, copy and paste. Edit achieves the same thing as double clicking on an item, which is, just a, which is effectively how you adjust the text um, and or add any descriptions or notes. So this here is just a standard line item they use in every single instance. There's no need for me to touch it at all. There's no text changes, no quantity changes, nothing. So I would just right click on it and go mark complete. And as you can see, it's magically disappeared into the background. 
The same applies to this next one here about the energy report. I don't have a BASICS on this job, I don't have an ABSA or a QBSA or any of those other um, reports. Uh, I've got no divine knowledge about uh, how the house is going to be positioned on a site. I've made no allowance for low E glazing and, and I want to bring that to the client's attention straight away that ultimately, you know, this is a perfect condition house. This, we have not thought about any of their specific site constraints or energy requirements. So right quick and mark complete. So so you can you can work from the top or you can work from the middle or you can work from wherever you like. I, I, I tend to jump around a lot because I like to uh, I guess minimize this list as fast as possible by by night by looking at the plans and establishing what I can get rid of to make this list as small as possible. Um, effectively it makes you feel like you've achieved a huge amount straight away. So so if I scroll right to the bottom here, you'll see we've got the integrity edge and the standard inclusions. Now these are our standard inclusions and, uh, and the integrity edge which are housed in the master price list. Uh, you may have your own. If, if you, uh, for instance, don't have PGH bricks or you don't use schlage door furniture or you use uh, metal roofs instead of tile roofs as standard, then you're going to have to maintain your own list of this in your own database and you'll have to delete our one and apply yours on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, the standards as they are all come with, with our standard inclusions printed on them. So, I'm just going to select the very first item under standard inclusions, which is this BND item. And I'm just going to scroll down with my mouse and if you hold down the shift key on your keyboard and click on the last one, it selects every item in between, as you can see. And if you right click on any of those orange areas and go mark complete, they all in fall into the background. And now we've got a screen that's a little less uh, intimidating and, and, and we're getting closer to, to actual estimating less than notes. The same applies with this general notes item, uh, you know, we can design your home, blah, blah, blah. It goes on every single job. I don't, it doesn't affect me what's in it. I'm not going to adjust it in any way. So I'm just going to right click and go mark complete. As you can see, we've gone from a, a thing that had to, you know, took us almost a minute to scroll through to saying that is a little bit more workable. And we're just going to continue just jumping around and, until we can, uh, minimize that as far as possible. The next one would be the peering. As I said at the start of this training, there's absolutely no allowance for peering uh, in our base price. We also don't have a contour survey, so we've got no knowledge as to whether or not there, there's cut and fill platform, whether things need peering at any point. We don't know the site classification, so therefore, it's not in our best interest to go and load the job by making allowance for peering. What we prefer to do is just bring to the client's attention from the onset. As I said from the start, this house is perfect conditions. If you're sitting on sand, that it's perfect conditions. We're literally just scraping off some grass. Happy days. That's all we've allowed for. So we just right click and go mark complete. Once again, we're back exactly where I was talking about before. As we've just identified, there's actually a mistake in this one here. I haven't changed. See, I just double-clicked on this and it brought up the edit. That should say preliminary estimate. So I'll have to fix that in the standard. So by double-clicking on it, it brings up the pricing item edit which allows you to add the items which uh, add text which shows in italics which is the description or note section of the item and to also adjust the text that that shows up printed so, so this this goes back to what I was saying earlier about our base price including 10 lineal meters of uh, sewer water and electrical and there's no allowance for overhead connection or upgraded mains so this is just reinforcing consistently, which is why I always encourage um, the, the sales team and, and the franchisees to, to copy a standard where possible. Um, 
I only ever copy standards because I, I there's no way I'd get every single one of these notes on a job if I started from scratch. I, I would always miss one. You'd miss a termite note, you'd miss a this one here that's very, very important about it being a preliminary estimate. You'll miss one and it'll likely come back to bite you. So I always recommend uh, yeah, copying an estimate. Sorry, copying a standard that's already been complete. So you can use the shift key, click on the first one, shift, click on the last one and it selects everything in between. You can also use your control key which is just located underneath shift and click on any that you like and it doesn't do those in between unless you specifically tell it to. So that's just a useful thing if you want to you know, cherry pick a couple and mark them all off. You want this one and that one and that one. So in this instance I'm just going to go shift and right click, mark complete. Same applies to this assumed M and assumed N2 site classification note which reinforces what we've got on the cover page here. So whilst on the cover page we've said that's what we've allowed, the job workup has essentially stated what the repercussions are should it not turn out to be that way, which is very important. So shift, right click, mark complete. <clears throat> Same goes for importation and or exportation of fill. We assume that we're able to either bench the site and uh, you know, use the fill on site underneath the house platform uh, or if we have to import fill then that's chargeable to the client and or if we have to get fill off site because it's in the way and, and there's uh, significant earthworks being undertaken and then once again that's the client's responsibility and client's costs not ours. Mark complete. And then this one here is just a general note reinforcing that it's a preliminary estimate and that essentially, you know, we need confirmation of areas, need a site survey, and we need a geotechnical report. Now this note here is, is very useful because it ties in very well with uh, the standard letter that uh, recently got updated and went live, uh, which is available in merge documents. If I just click on merge docs and type in prelim. Preliminary Estimate Correspondence from the All New Home Franchises Group, which means it's available in your database also. If we just generate that. It's a lovely new cover page. Um, you'll see it goes on here to talk about the requirement for an engineer. Oh, there's a space there. Oh, it's because there's no site address. So this, yeah, this job relies upon mail merge fields being complete in iGyro. So if you don't put the site address in, then obviously the site address can't appear in the job, uh, in the report. Uh, nor can any contact details unless you put those in, and a job number can't either unless you put a job number in. Um, so, so this document here is essentially the cover sheet that you attach to your preliminary estimate, which reinforces the fact that this is very much a, a base price tender and that uh, without having this contour survey or this geotech and, and or a design service, we really can't do anything more about fixing that price for them. So it's, it's all about reinforcing that requirement to try and get some cash out of a client and, and, and um, work out whether or not they're genuine effectively or if they're just tire kicking, going and seeing 40 different builders and looking at base prices. If you present this document, you say, hey, this is what we've got. This is as firm as we can make this price without having, firstly, without knowing what site you're on, and secondly, without having all this information, and then presenting them a very, very cheap proposal in terms of providing those services might be the difference between getting them tied to you or just walking away. So what you will notice, if we just jump back here to the iProx, is once you hit save, it refreshes. So I can change any of these criteria here and if I hit save it bounces back to standard. So um, so you need to be mindful that you know uh, I've just hit save so now if I want to get back to where I was I just click here and go back to incomplete only. And now I've got my, my working list effectively. So we're just going to right click this preliminary estimate item. And as you can see, we've, we've got very, very few items here that, that need to be charged out extra beyond that. Um, 
you know, we've got the ladder box, no ladder box included, no perimeter fencing or gates, and no hard and or soft landscaping. Right click, mark complete. Uh, our standard base price does only allows for a, a an inspection or an exposed termite barrier. There's absolutely no allowance for uh, physical barriers such as trithor or smart film or termi mesh or anything of the like. Uh, we rely on a visual inspection around the outside and collars to the to the pipes internally. So this just once again just reinforces what they are actually getting. All right, now now we've kind of cleared out all the standard notes, we can actually start to have a look at the design and having a look at which items now need to be added back in as a chargeable item. So we just come back here to the drawings. <coughs> Um, so no, uh, there's really no magical formula to it. You uh, either look at the plans on screen and, and uh, process them as you go, or you print them out and get a pen and squiggle all over them and highlight things that stand out. I, I tend to do this the later. Uh, I always try to print out a set of plans and, and, and really look at it objectively before I even open IPROX and say, while well, my, well, my head is still clear, what is unusual about this house? You know, what needs to be charged out for in a den of A? So if we just get this little line tool and start marking things up, for example, or even highlight, obviously a portico. That's, that's non-standard. That needs to be brought to the attention. Double hung windows, also not included. Um, that sliding door standard, there's a rake ceiling here. That's certainly of interest. Uh, it seems to be timber decking. Uh, there's no decking included to lower floor um, covered deck areas. If this was an upper floor area and it was charged out as an upper floor, then it would include timber decking and a handrail and balustrade. Uh, because we've used the lower floor area, there's not even an allowance for concrete there. It's literally just a timber post with a strip footing and a ceiling above. Um, we've got timber there. Um, we've got a biparting sliding door. That's that's chargeable extra. So we'll just highlight that. Same applies to this here. So as you can see, I kind of just jump around. Uh, rainwater tanks aren't included in the base price. They need to be charged out. There's an 820 door here which faces to the external. So a standard door won't last the test of time there, it's going to fail uh, and we won't be able to get warranty. So we've got to upgrade that either to a fiberglass or alternatively to an aluminium framed full glass door. Um, what else have we got? Ducted mechanical ventilation. So because there is no window or skylight to this toilet to comply with BCA requirements, you've got to have some source of air, uh, air movement to the room. So you'd have to put a ducted uh, exhaust fan in that location. Um, our standard is actually uh, vinyl sliding ropes. We actually charge out these hinge doors uh, much more because firstly you've got to buy a jam for them and then secondly you've got to buy doors for them and then you've got to pay someone to hang the doors and paint the doors and you know, you know, take the doors off, paint them and put them back on and then you've got to provide door furniture to them. So, so these hinge doors to robes and linens are, are always charged out extra above our vinyls because our vinyls are so cheap it's not even funny. Um, so I'm just going to grab it. Uh, what do we got? Oval, rectangle. So these are just all the little cool f features available in uh, this software PDF exchange. So I'm just going to, oh, well done. Just going to highlight that to come back to. Same applies to this here, the fact that it's got four doors. Same applies to this linen. Alright, now the breakfast bar doesn't have any dimensions on it, uh, so we're just going to double check its actual sizing to make sure that uh, it's, it's not oversized. Alright, so it's 900 exactly, which is perfect. 
Uh, if this was stone, it would be to a maximum of 800, and then that 900 have to, would have to be redrawn or charged out extra. <clears throat> the base price includes for two cavity sliding doors, so if there's any more than two cavity sliding doors, then you've got to charge that out extra. And the base price also only includes three external doors, whether they be sliding glass or hinged. So if we look here, we've got one, two, three, four. So we know straight away there's one door more than the base price allows for, so we'll have to charge that out. Shane, these allowances that you're saying are in the base price, are they documented anywhere? They're documented in the actual line items in it, that the upgrade items in the IPROX effectively. So if I type in the word sliding, it says additional glass sliding doors and entry doors after the first three and additional cavity sliding doors after the first two. So these items are all housed in the calculation bar. So they're things that build up the price that the client can't actually see. So if I just type in the word calculation here, you'll see those items are all housed here. And they're, I mean, if there's better um, naming required to them, then so be it. But um, to date, I, I, I haven't had anyone say that they're less than clear. So what that means is on the actual job workup, you select the calc bar option, which is the, one of the three boxes just below the estimate price list to show you what they are. And they're the ones that are currently that in this job. Yeah, so that assists the franchisee to come in and see, okay, I know this is allowed. Anything over and above the allowance in the calc bar, I'll have to put into the general information that's visible to the client so that they can see that extra is going in. Uh, well, no, we don't suggest that it goes gets printed. We always leave it in the base price. So, so items that go in the calc bar are specifically hidden on this uh, estimate price list uh, visually on screen and, and also actually on the printed estimate sheet because they're things that build up the price that the client doesn't necessarily need to be aware of and don't necessarily need to be documented in any fashion. If you start writing on an estimate um, that you're charging them for each extra sliding door, they'd, they'd, they'd probably think you're, um, you're a <laughs> bit of a stitch. So when we do... When we, when we do contracts, why have we got statements in there that ex, uh, biparting doors have been included? So, uh, well, biparting isn't in the calc bar. That's their general items. So, so we're charging them for for four sliding doors or four external doors, and we're charging extra again for two of them being biparting because biparting isn't isn't detailed in the specification. Yeah, so it's items over and above what's allowed in the description for the base price go into the general items? Correct, yes. Yep. So if, if it's documented in the specification as being one thing, then it needs to be stated that it's something other on the addendum A or, or on the preliminary estimate. Where, where the specification doesn't talk about it um, specifically, then, then those items go into the calc bar. I mean, our specification this... doesn't say we're only giving you three sliding doors. <clears throat> yep, yep. So where you've got that lift off hinge door to the WC there, that yep. would go into general because that's something over and above what we normally do. Well what you're saying? Well we would actually take it off the plan. So I mean this is a this this has been detailed for construction effectively. Um, so it's got a great deal oh. more notes on it than what a standard uh, brochure design would have. So standard lift off hinges are absolutely no more money than standard. Um, they're just yep. literally a different hinge so that you, know, you can get in and help people you know, should they pass out. Um, but yes, if it was, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've pushed hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if, if this was a set of drawings that you were going to go to contract on, then yes, I would specifically recommend that you would add a line item to the general section of IPROX uh, yourself and you, you'd specifically note that the WC has lift off hinges because it is out of the ordinary. It's just not documented to be that way. Let's kill that phone. Um, so we've, we've kind of had a look at the floor plan now. We've established items here which are outside of the norm. And, and either need to be charged in the calc bar or alternatively charged as line items on, in, in iGyro, uh, sorry, in, in iProx that get printed on the estimate sheet. 
So we'll just keep going through the elevations. Um, first off the bat, 25.90 ceilings. Our standard base price allows for 24.40, and all that kind of stuff's actually printed if you generate the. If we come here to calculators and go to generate standard price list and just choose a council, for example. Wow, I really wish I didn't have all those extra databases now. Um, and just hit generate. You'll see there's a standard little blurb that goes on the bottom of this price list here, which which details further what I've been saying effectively about what is included in our price. Uh, this needs to be adjusted. We've just uh, just in recent weeks uh, increased that to a one meter fall across the site, or 500 even cut and fill. Um, so I haven't had this quite adjusted yet because there's still one or two standards I'm still fixing in regards to that. Um, but we do have the 2400 high flat ceilings, the hip concrete tile roof, um, sliding aluminium windows and or doors, so, so no allowance for biparting uh, or double sliding or things of the like. Um, so, so this is where you can get a lot of that information from that, that explains ex uh, what it, effectively how we're deriving our prices and, and specifically what is not included, i.e. external concrete, driveways, patios and alfrescos, gates, retaining walls, etc, etc. So I'll just close that down. So we're at 2590 high ceilings which are non-standard. Uh, once again we've got the pergola, so we'll just highlight that again. Uh, cladding, that's non-standard, our base price is driven by face brick uh, veneer, so we need to charge out for this linear, whether or not it's, uh, we need to have a look in IPROX and see whether it's a chargeable item or a credit. Some cladding types uh, for us here are cheaper to do than brickwork, and, and obviously they have a, then a negative item associated with them. Uh, 25 degree roof pitch is non-standard for us, 20 degrees is actually standard. Um, but 90mm painted timber posts are standard, as we just saw. Um, so we've got the Colorbon roof at 25 degrees again, Pergola again, linear cladding again. Now, this store here, when I look at it, it I, I interpret that to be a glass door, uh, only because of that, that section of framing there. Uh, people may interpret it different ways, but if I was a client and I saw that, I would be generally of the opinion that that is some kind of panel. So we will definitely price this door out as aluminium framed instead of fiberglass. It's a little bit more expensive, but then if the client comes back and says, no, we're really, we, you know, we don't want a full glass door to our laundry, we can put it back from there. So that's effectively um, us establishing and this painted timber feature. So we've now looked at the plans, we've established what is standard, what is not standard, what needs to be charged out. Now it's obviously Hub Us 4, which works out perfectly. So what we might do now is we'll save this document and it'll be right where it needs to be next week when we pick up again and we can actually get into the, uh, the quantification and the adding of the items and adjusting the values for the items that already exist and, uh, and hopefully within the, you know, hopefully three quarters or you know, towards the end of next session we should be able to knock that one out and, and have a printable estimate that we can present to a client which has all the information about what they are getting and specifically what they're not getting. So I'll close that down. So does anyone have any questions uh, or any comments? Uh, I guess as Richard's email says, we're still definitely looking um, for, for people to send some files over if, if they have some. Um, Yeah, we, we need people to be contributing. We need to see the kind of plans that you're in, the, the, the kinds of plans that you guys are getting sent to you um, so that we know how we can tailor the information and the training. We, we don't want to obviously be teaching bare bones if you guys are not ever getting presented plans that are of that fashion. So. Hey. Yes, how are you, mate? Good and you? Yeah, yeah, very well. Sorry I dodged your call before. I was enjoying a subway. No one gets in the way of that. <laughs> okay. And the, 
the reason for my call was to see where we can maybe price the which way which is in our brochure because I don't see I don't see a standard uh, or really a cost estimate for it. That is true. And the, um, so and the, reason, and the reason I would like the reach way to be costed is A, the roof structure is quite different from the normal uh, pitch roof that we've done so far. That's A and B. I would like to put that on as a, as a house land package. So that will definitely help me than just more or more than just um, you know, a general idea of how you pitch the, that kind of roof structure and all the columns in front and so forth. Okay. Well, I'll um I'll flag that with with drafting. I I know those designs are definitely overdue. Um, looking at my task list, 220 days overdue to be exact. Um, it it's been a a lack of having work in drawings. I've I've been um able to slide a few in every so often with the drafting team. I think they're they're definitely working at thereabouts capacity at the moment. Um, but I'll certainly have a word and and, and see if I can slip that one in. It. It won't be for the next training session, but it certainly may be possible for the one thereafter. Okay. I will, I will um, uh, speak to you in the meantime to, to just get some advice from you from, in terms of helping you with that. Yeah, yeah, easy done. Okay, thank you. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, just a quick one, Shane. Yes. Yeah, just at the very beginning there, you... Um, uh, you picked up the Avalon 191 as a standard uh, to work off. You said it's regularly updated. Yep. It, it had a date on it, the 1st of the 2nd, 15. Uh, when we go to that, how do we know when it was last updated? Is there any, any way of uh, work that out? There isn't, but it is certainly a good suggestion that I can I can make to um, make to IT I, I think that would definitely be useful and, and it's, it's something I've thought about myself before when I've gone oh when did I last touch this <laughs> so, so so yeah the date is the date it was created and, and I'm usually in there oh, I wouldn't say weekly but definitely bi-weekly adjusting the notes and tidying things up as new things come to light um, or as you know as I was saying about you know us increasing our allowance for earthworks but I think I think you're definitely onto something there about um, capturing the last date of um, of update. I'll I'll see I'll, I'll see what we can do in terms of that. Okay, thank you. Too easy. Uh, can this session be emailed for those who missed it? Well, it can. I've recorded this one, and I'm going to see what it does after we finish this session and see how big the file is. I don't know whether email is going to be possible, but we might be able to put it up somewhere and send out a link to everyone that you guys can then forward on forward that link. Um, so I'll, I'll have a look at that, and, and we'll work that out. Uh, probably not this afternoon, but uh, definitely tomorrow and get an email out happening. Too easy. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your attendance. So I think we had 14 there at one stage, which was uh, got to be a record. Um, so I said thank you very much, and I'll see you all next week. Hopefully, we can actually get into the quantities. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Okay.